So next up is another alumni of, or another member of the MIT DCI, Taj Draya, who is known as the co-inventor of the Lightning Network and is a Bitcoin, a, a Bitcoin developer working on scalability, most notably his project, Utrex. So thank you for joining us, Taj. Hello? Okay, hi. Is this working? Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Emil. I, let me share screen. Okay, cool. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's too bad we can't be in uh, person, but I think by next year, we'll be able to do this again in person. Uh, it's been a long year without um, conferences. And I guess for, for maybe many people watching, the MIT Bitcoin Expo last March was the sort of last, that was the last time I saw like a bunch of people in person because it was sort of right at the beginning of this whole thing. Anyway, cool. Um, so, uh, and thanks to Neha, that was a really good sort of start off for the day. Um, I'm going to talk in some ways the opposite uh, side of things uh, and saying like, well, do we have too much security? Um, and talking about defending against 99.999% attacks, which is sort of a silly way to put it. But um, yeah, so what is too much security, right? Like Bitcoin is pretty secure, right? Well, yeah, sure. There's all these issues, these problems, but like generally, um, there haven't been big reorg attacks, right? We haven't seen that kind of thing. And like, if you mined a bunch of Bitcoin in, I don't know, 2010, like it's still there, right? Like we haven't seen these kind of huge breaks, which is great, it's still working. Uh, if it stopped working, we probably wouldn't be talking about it still. Um, and more security is better, right? We need to like keep strengthening this so to some extent, um, but maybe it's too secure. So what does that mean? What does too secure mean? Um, so I have some examples of too much security. Uh, and some of these may be somewhat technical, some of them not, less so, uh, but like 8,000 bit RSA keys. You see them sometimes, people use like, you know, like, hey, send me an SSH key so I can like give you a login into the server or whatever. And then it's like this giant two page long RSA key. And you're like, oh, okay. Like it works, right? It's slower, but it's sort of overkill. It doesn't really meaningfully do anything stronger than like a two or 4,000 bit RSA key, right? Because, or maybe it does, but we like can't think of a reason why it would. It seems like any computer that can break a 2,000 bit RSA key before the sun burns out could also break an 8,000 bit RSA key before the sun burns out. As far as we can tell, we don't know of anything like, and so it's sort of, you know, hey, you know, maybe there's a reason, but we don't have a reason for this to be more secure. Uh, similarly, 24 word uh, BIP39 BIP seed phrases. So some of you may use these kind of seed phrases to store your Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's just a bunch of words. And basically what happens is you write that on the words, you hash that all and it turns into this uh, seed. And then you derive your private keys from that seed. And this is a cool system. Um, you can do it with 12 words and that's secure. Or you can double that and use 24 words, which is more secure, I guess, but in a certain sense, I think it's less secure because it's sort of now it's longer and it's easier to screw something up or, or forget part. Uh, and it doesn't, as far as we know, give any meaning, sec meaningful security gain over the 12 words, right? The 12 words gives you 128 bits of entropy and the 24 is, well, twice as much, 256 bits of entropy. But like, you know, can, is there, what computer can do 128 operation, uh, two to the 128 operations, but not two to the 256. It doesn't, we don't know about anything that can do that. It doesn't seem like there's any theory that like leads to that. So it seems sort of like, why are you doing this? Uh, and then sort of another funny example, like TSA. I, you know, not that I've been to an airport in the last year, but I do remember them and remember being like, is this even secure? Like, it seems like you can get stuff through here but it's a huge waste of time and like everyone's taking off their shoes and like, I don't know. Yeah. So there are costs and there are problems with this sort of too much security thing. And then sometimes it can sort of paradoxically reduce security. I, I would say something like a 24 word seed phrase. I would sort of caution again. I would use the 12 one. I was like, look, it's smaller. There's le there's just, just as much, you know, cryptographic security and less likelihood that you're going to lose it or something. Um, so we sort of want like a defined specification of like, okay, what, what security level are we targeting here? And in Bitcoin, there is no specification, right? It's just there's a paper and then there's a code base and it keeps changing. And even the code base, like there's a bunch of different clients and you know, who knows? Um, but we can look at it and sort of say, well, it mostly has 128 bit security, right? That seems to be the design 
Um, and so the meaning of that is that it resists an attacker who can perform up to two to the 128 operations. And operations is a little vague, right? Because whether that's hashes or like elliptic curve operations, uh, and, and those two things are different, right? Hashes are much faster generally than elliptic curve operations. So it's not, there's a lot of sort of subtleties here, but generally you can say, okay, this is one, two to the 128 operations to break this. Um, some things on the other hand have more security in Bitcoin, right? I, I gave some examples there, but uh, a big one I keep thinking about forever, it doesn't really matter, but uh, you've got these 20 byte pay to pub key hash or pay to uh, witness pub key hash addresses. Right, so I'm sure people are familiar. If you've used Bitcoin, you have used one of these two types of addresses, right? The the uh, the all lowercase BC one prefix one is the new uh, BEC32 type SegWit address, and the older style uh, it starts with a one and is mixed case uh, is base58 check uh, addresses, and so these use uh, 20 byte hashes, so 160 bits of total hash output. And that's kind of overkill, right? If you're if you're targeting a 128-bit security, now you've got this 160-bit hash and you don't need it. That extra four bytes doesn't really do anything as far as we know. Um, and so you could shorten these things, right? So in the bottom here, this is like, you know, this is what the length of a current Bitcoin address. And I'm saying you can shorten it to this long with no meaningful security loss, right? You still have the same properties. Uh, it's still two to one. You know, the idea is, yes, it's easier now to perform a second pre-image attack on the key hash, but the second pre-image attack on the key hash is already much harder than just you know, figuring out a EC private key from an EC public key. So people aren't gonna, you know, you're, you're always gonna go for the easier attack, right? And so with this, shorter address, the easier, now Now those attacks are both as easy as each other, right? The, the second pre-image and the private key derivation now become equal. So, you know, it does seem more efficient. And you could have a little bit shorter addresses, right? That, you know, not a huge difference, but you could. So this is something of an overshoot. Am I saying we really need to switch to like 16 byte pub key ashes? Well, probably not, right? This is not a huge gain. Uh, it's already widespread. Uh, and anyway, we're tip switching to Taproot, which is uh, even longer uh, pretty soon anyway. And so it's it's not like a big deal, but it's sort of like, huh, yeah, you you probably could shave off four bytes there with no real no real problem. Um, and those kind of things, it's like, well, yeah, are there inefficiencies here that we can use? You know, we can sort of say, hey, let's tweak this. This is this is overshoot. We're we're going too far here, and we can get better efficiency and better performance in other parts of the system without meaningfully getting rid of security, right? It's sort of too much here. Um, on the other hand, there are some things in Bitcoin that have less than 128-bit security. So for example, uh, pay to script hash, it's 80-bit security. And it's the same length as the, you know, the addresses are the same length as the pay to pub key hash ones. They're 160 bits long. However, there's sort of a, the, the tricky part is it's a different threat model. Whereas in pay to pub key hash, you're just making your own key and you know, someone sends money to it. Um, in pay to script hash, there are potentially many cases, and maybe most of the cases, it's like multi-sig, right? Uh, where there's multiple keys involved. And that's like interactive. So you might be making a multi-sig address with people who you don't trust. And if that's the case, they may be able to perform collision attacks and sort of say, hey, you know, what's your key? And then, okay, here's my key, but actually they have this other separate key and then now they can like take the whole thing. So there are attacks where you can do it in two to the 80 operations because of uh, the length of data script hash. This is fairly limited cases, right? It's, it's, it's limited to cases where you're you know, creating multi-sig addresses with people who are trying to attack you, which maybe you shouldn't do, but you know, maybe you should. Lightning Networks sort of rests on the idea of like you're opening multi-sig sort of channels with people and they might try to rip you off and we have defenses against this. Um, so this is fixed with uh, pay to witness script hash and we, you know, you have a back up to two to the 128 security. So, and what I want to say is like, yeah, this is sort of theoretical, but like two to the 80 operations has happened, right? Bitcoin has done, I don't know, two to the 90 or so uh, hash operations and all the proof of work ever. So um, the other thing, thing that really complicates this is that in Bitcoin, there's all these you know, traditional sort of cryptographic security guarantees where we're like, okay, here's this elliptic curve property and here's these hashes and we know about pre-image attacks and collision attacks and all these things. 
But then there's also these economic incentives, right? It doesn't fit in the standard way, right? Because clearly you don't have to do two to the 128 hashes to say, rewrite the entire Bitcoin blockchain, right? The total thing is something like two to the 90. So yeah, way easier to just reorg from Genesis or my, you know, more than 51% attack. And so it's like, well, we clearly are not just using 128-bit security, right? We also have the sort of economic incentive assumption and, you know, was initially described as, you know, the attacker ought to, might, ought to find it more profitable to play by the rules, such rules that favor him with more new coins than everyone else combined than to undermine the system and the ability. So, well, so that was Satoshi back in the day. And that is one of the, like, huge aspects of Bitcoin that like makes it possible, right? Because it's not possible to get this kind of consensus with the traditional um, cryptographic, you know, standard guarantees. So can we do something here, right? We sort of are also relying on this, like not assuming on a, you know, assuming there isn't a 51% attack, which could happen, but hasn't so far. We've got economic incentives that sort of, you know, reduce this. Can we leverage these and combine the 51% attack assumption uh, for better performance by reducing security in other places? Now, this seems dangerous, and I, you know, but uh, yeah, it, one of the reasons you probably don't want to just try this everywhere 51% um, hash rate changes, right? So, what may have been um, secure against a 51% attack a few years ago would not be today, right? The Bitcoin mining rate has increased by trillion time, you know, so co compared to 10 years ago, it's, I don't know, trillions or something, you can look it up. Um, also, 51% attacks don't really kill Bitcoin. Um, they're bad, you definitely want to avoid them, but it's not like, oh, there's a 51% attack, it's all over, like, let's, we got to all switch to, I don't know, proof of stake or something. Um, it more like halts the system, right, and p potentially temporarily. Um, so you don't want to put your coins at more risk by saying, okay, I'm leveraging this like 51%. But what about, you know, 99.99%? So like this is secure against really powerful attackers, not two to the 128, but so powerful that they could easily destroy Bitcoin. Um, so something like this, where you could say, look, an attacker would either have to perform two to the 128 operations or perform operations equivalent to mining a million blocks at the current difficulty. Like, oh, well, yeah, Bitcoin only has, 600,000 blocks or something. And most of those are much easier than current. So if, if you have an attacker that can, you know, reorg to Genesis in the, span, in the span of a few days, yeah, we're, you know, it might be overkill to defend against that. And um, yeah, current is the important part, right? You need to, you need, you can't target previous difficulty. So something like, oh, I'm going to make my address shorter based on the current difficulty is tricky because you know, your address might, your, your UTXO might stay there for a long time. So there is an application to this, which is something I've been working on for a while, and it sort of led to this. Um, so if you have a secure accumulator for Bitcoin, right? So instead of a Merkle tree, just using transactions of block, put it, you know, so right now in Bitcoin, you, you have a Merkle tree of all the transactions of block go into this Merkle tree structure. You put that Merkle root into the block hash, you know, the block header, and you hash it, and that's, that's the structure of Bitcoin. Um, but we can also use the same kind of technology to say, instead of keeping track of every UTXO, every coin in the system, just in a regular database, we also put this into a kind of Merkle tree accumulator. Uh, and this is something that's working now. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and this is a good application for this uh, sort of reduction of security. Uh, where Merkle trees rely on collision resistant hash functions, right? So in general, in Merkle trees, you say, okay, uh, you add these four aspects, right? Zero, zero, one, two, and three, you add them into this set and then you hash them together in this way so you only have one hash at the end. But then people can prove uh, that zero, one, two, and three were in the original set, right? So the proof for zero is one, five. The proof for one is zero, five. The proof for two is three, four, and so on. Um, so if you want to attack it, say, okay, well, there's a two and, you know, I want to insert something and then prove something I didn't insert. Well, you need to find two things, right? So find two and two prime where two is not equal to two prime, right? Find two different elements you want to insert where the hashes are the same, right? And then you insert one of them and then you prove the other one, but the proof for the other one is the same, right? And so now you can, you've sort of broken the, the security of the system because you insert this two and you prove two prime, which is different. Um, 
And this is a collision attack, right? So finding two things that have two different things that hash to the same thing is a collision attack, which is easier than a regular hash preimage attack, right? So if you have a um, 256-bit hash function, it only takes two to the 128 operations to perform this type of attack, uh, is in contrast to a preimage attack where it takes this full 200, two to the 256. Um, so we can sort of mix these, the, the mining proof of work and a prevention of these collision attacks. So what you can do is you can say, I'm going to put the block hash confirming a transaction into the UTXO data that goes into this uh, Merkle tree. So now you're, you have got this uh, commitment to the proof of work. So for example, in this like, you know, two element we were putting there, uh, it commits to the proof of work. It also can commit to its position within the tree. So you can't, the attacker can't like um, collide with an arbitrary element of the tree. So for example, like the hashes are now, you know, the number two, because where it is, the block hash that confirms it and the UTXO data. Um, so this makes collision attacks much harder because instead of just performing a single hash to sort of tr an attempt at finding two colliding in hashes, uh, you need to mine a block for every attempt. So, and, and you can't reuse this work, right? If you, if every time you try one, it changes the block itself, right? Because you're, you're trying, you know, so it's, it's these two trees together, right? You've got one Merkle tree that goes into the block hash and another Merkle tree for the UTXO set. Um, so now you've changed the security, the, you know, the amount of work you have to do. It's still a collision attack, right? It's still two to the 128 operations or two to the n over two operations, but the operation has changed from a hash, you know, just one hash function to mining an entire block, which currently is like two to the 70 something hashes. So that is a huge increase, even though in some sense, it's, this, it's still a collision attack. Um, so yeah, if you have 32 byte hashes here, you would need to mine two, two to the 128 blocks to collide, or to just do a pre-image stack, you need to do two to the 256 hashes. However, if you say reduce your hash length to 16 bytes, well, now you'd need to mine two to the 64 blocks to collide, or two to the 128 hashes to, to second pre-image. And two to the 64 blocks is um, a lot of blocks, 18 quintillion blocks. So it does seem like, yeah, you're you're a little, you know, it's it's a reduction in security, but really, uh, is it is there a meaningful attacker that you know, like, are you meaningfully defending against an attacker that can mine eighteen quintillion blocks? Like, doesn't seem like it, right? So um, that's the general idea I was, I've been talking about here. Um, do we need to reduce hash sizes for these things? No. Um, is too much security a waste, though? Yeah, it, it can be, right? It would be very efficient to reduce the size of these things by half and potentially reduce downloads and reduce disk storage and speed things up like that's a meaningful gain maybe more so than like address you know addresses are a little bit longer than they need to be but it's not like addresses are twice as long or anything so it's you know um and it's it, this is i think an interesting idea and i sort of want to put it out there because it's something we should think about maybe there are places other places people are working on where you know there's proof of work happening right the bitcoin blockchain keeps going on and does doing enormous amounts of work. Um, and maybe we're wasting some of that work. Maybe we can uh, keep you know, using it for something you know, to increase efficiency. Um, and I'm sure if you, you know, looked at the news or whatever in the last I don't know, six months since Bitcoin's been going up, a lot of people think um, Bitcoin is really wasteful and it's totally pointless. And it's, you know, th there is, I don't think they're, they're right about that, but there is things where like, yeah, are we using this proof of work? It's happening. Are we really taking full advantage of it? Can we leverage it for more efficiency, for more power in this system? Uh, and then I have the sort of uh, meme where you can, you know, 32 byte hashes there. Well, there are potentially uh, 16 byte hashes, which might be even better. Um, so thanks. I you know have this out here as sort of an idea. I'm not like, hey, we should reduce security of all these things. Um, but I do think it's an interesting topic where it's like, hey, are there areas here where we're, you know, leaving some performance on the table or potentially, you know, paradoxically reducing security by going too far and things like this. Um, okay, so questions, comments, disagreements, and also, yeah, I wanted to reiterate uh, something that Neha said at the end of the last presentation. Uh, I work at the DCI. It's really cool. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, get in touch. Um, I, this is a sort of GitHub link of the one of the things I'm working on. You can look at it, um, you know, 
get in contact. We're pretty, we're pretty cool. Uh, everything's remote now. So if you're in whatever part of the world, it really doesn't make much difference. So yeah, thanks. Um, cool. Should I, Great. should I start so, answering there's questions yeah, on we, this? Uh, we yeah, oh, we have ahead. some questions <laughs> from the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll ask them sure. to you to save yourself the logistics there. Okay. Uh, so okay. I vote. one of our questions is, uh, would you suggest saving the state of the blockchain in some way to reduce uh, resource consumption? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't, um, I didn't go into this, maybe not enough here, uh, where the idea of, of the, the U-Tree-XO project, this, this accumulator I'm, I'm working on uh, with a bunch of other open source contributors is great. Um, the idea is it's, it's sort of like pruning the entire UTXO set. So currently in Bitcoin, we store, um, you can store the whole blockchain, which is 350 gigs, or you can prune it and say, look, once I've got the blockchain, I don't really need to keep it around. I can delete most of it. Um, and you store the UTXO set, which is about four or something gigabytes, uh, you know, the current state of who owns what. And this basically prunes that as well. UTXO says, okay, don't store the, the UTXO set either. Store basically a little Merkle root of it. Um, and it's not quite just a Merkle root, but it's, you know, less than a kilobyte. It's very small. And then uh, transactions prove that the UTXOs they're spending exist uh, with these Merkle proofs. Um, and so that's that's one example of where we can potentially leverage uh, smaller proofs. Um, so yeah, so it is a different way to sort of, you know, pruning the UTXO set. So now you don't need the blockchain, you don't need the UTXO set, you can run a full node in a very small amount of space. And that's what our code currently does. So if you're interested, check it out. Great. Um, we have time for about two more questions. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, converse to what you were saying about, you know, reducing the hash size. Isn't increasing the hash size supposed to future-proof the system instead? Um, few, well, maybe. So it's sort of like, well, you can't, right? In that, it's you could say like, let's well, let's make a new system, and we're, you know, we're going to put something in Bitcoin where we have 512-bit um, pubkey hashes or something, or we we use an elliptic curve that's 400 or 500 bits long or something, and, you know, double the security. Well, okay, but you still have almost everyone using the the previous part of the system. So, you know, if if someone makes a computer that can, you know, derive a private key from a public key, you know, which takes 200 to the 128 EC ops or something like that, um, yeah, maybe you're safe, but everyone else isn't, and so really the whole system's broken, right? It, it's it's not you're not alone, uh, and so you're like if you're saying I'm going to make my my bitcoins twice as secure as everyone else's it sort of doesn't work right because if everyone else's bitcoins get stolen the whole system sort of collapse you know it's not worth much to say well i still have mine because now bitcoins have just all been stolen and like everyone just leaves the system uh so so you know there may be ways to sort of upgrade but you kind of need maybe not everyone but like almost everyone to upgrade because if there's you know Five million coins out of the twenty-one million that are stealable with this new computer, like yeah, you know, the system's pretty, pretty, pretty in trouble. Great. Uh, we've got two more questions. The next Great. one is, uh, what about quantum computers? Is Bitcoin ready for that? Um, right now, no, definitely not. Uh, if you have a quantum computer, you can, you know, grab all Satoshi's coins from Craig Wright or whatever. You can. Um, you can. You, there's so many um, unhashed public keys that are known that have enormous amounts of coins. And so you sort of pick one and perform a quantum, you know, the uh, growers or shorts. I always get them mixed up. You perform that attack and, and then you uh, take all the coins. Uh, so no, right now it's not. Um, there could be, right? We know like Bitcoins, a system like Bitcoin would be pretty amenable to quantum safe, you know, so we know a bunch of quantum safe signature schemes. So we could use that there worse in that they're like bigger and slower and stuff but you can do it um but yeah the the question of upgrading is very difficult it's like you sort of have to change it you know get everyone's keys because if there's still five or six million coins you know even if it's only a quarter of the coins out there that are now stealable it's like well is this system really going to survive that uh, there's also a question of you know quantum quantum computers and proof of work how do those interact so so right now no um it's something people are sort of thinking about, but it's it's hard because you got to upgrade everyone. But it maybe is the case where if a quantum computer comes out or it's imminent, it's scary enough that almost everyone sort of moves 
And then we make some kind of software to say, okay, all these old keys are now frozen forever. And it would be very disruptive, but it's probably something that can be survived. But we're not really planning for that right now. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Taj, for your uh, thoughts on Bitcoin's future security. Uh, our next panel is with Michael Perkin, uh, uh, also talking about Bitcoin security, joined by Jameson Law, Jimmy Song, Michael Flex, and Michael Flexman. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes uh, with, with the Bitcoin security and privacy panel.